Piper Alpha, one of the most productive oil platforms in the North Sea. It's a city anchored in the ocean, supporting more than 200 workers and pumping oil 24 hours a day. Then a routine working day ends in disaster. 167 men perish in one hour and 30 minutes. Now, using cutting-edge computer technology, we reveal exactly what went wrong. Disasters don't just happen. They're caused by a sequence of critical events, locked in time. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. Europe. Scotland. The North Sea. Wednesday, July the 6th, 1988. Piper Alpha is stationed 176 kilometers out from the city of Aberdeen, in the middle of the infamously rough North Sea. It's built to survive winds of up to 185 kilometers per hour and waves as high as 28.5 meters. With more than half of it hidden below the waves, the entire structure towers 230 meters above the sea floor, two and a half times the height of the Statue of Liberty. But today, the North Sea is having one of its kinder days. There are 226 men on board Piper Alpha. Electrician Bob Ballantyne is one of them. It's one of these absolutely beautiful summers that you get in the North Sea. Uh, it was calm, it was uh, tranquil. To keep the massive rig running smoothly, the complex machinery requires regular servicing. It's a never-ending job. 7.45 a.m. Lead production operator Bernard Curtis issues permits for the day's maintenance work. They strictly enforce the rule that no one can work on the platform without one. It's just one of many systems in place to ensure safety on the massive rig. With 226 men living and working so close to such volatile fuel, it's vital. Piper Alpha has been in service for 12 years. Its main job is processing oil. This happens on the production deck. It's made of four modules. Module D contains power generation. Module C and B process oil and gas. In module A, oil is piped up from below the sea floor. Sitting on top of all this is a self-contained city with living quarters and entertainments for the small army of workers for whom Piper Alpha is a home away from home. It all happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 12 p.m. On the production deck, two maintenance workers are removing a safety valve. It's a routine job authorized that morning. They're due to finish by the end of the shift at 6 p.m. For control room operator Jeff Bollins, it's just another regular day. There was men doing maintenance. The oil wells were full of oil. The machines were up running, compressing gas. It was a higher activity. 5.10 p.m. Jeff Bollins begins his final shift in the control room before leaving the rig. It was a good shift because we were all happy on it. It was our last shift and we were going home in the morning, so it was always a good shift, the last one. Jeff talks to the control room operator he's relieving to familiarize himself with the day's business. There's nothing out of the ordinary to report. Six p.m. The day shift ends, but on the production deck, work on the safety valve isn't finished. Replacing it will have to wait until morning. It's not a problem. The pump it's connected to is shut down. There are now 62 men running Piper Alpha on the night shift. The other 164 are off duty, eating, relaxing, or sleeping in their living quarters. Nine forty-five p.m. Suddenly, an urgent alarm disrupts Jeff Bollin's routine shift. It 
it's an audible sound which brings your attention to it. You locate then on a visual basis what's happened and what we call the condensate pump and trip. Condensate is the oil man's term for LPG, liquefied petroleum gas, a volatile and highly flammable liquid. The pump compresses it to a pressure of 78 atmospheres. That's 45 times the pressure in a car tire. The pump has stopped working, but Jeff is still unfazed. I've seen the condensate pump trip that many times, I couldn't tell you about 20, 30, 100, 200, and it was something that needed attention and something that wasn't a major problem. And the quicker you attended to it, the less of a problem it was. Lead operator Bob Vernon goes down to the pump nine meters below the control room. It should be straightforward to restart it. But tonight, the production crew can't get it going. Piper Alpha continues to produce liquid condensate. There's now barely half an hour left before the storage tank fills up and the safety systems shut down the entire rig. This could lead to a complete loss of electrical power on the platform. Although not dangerous, it'll stop the rig producing oil and the crew will go to almost any lengths to avoid this. They're feeling the pressure. Things became more and more of a problem. So what started off as quite a routine incident and a minor problem was snowballing. Normally, a second pump would be available. But tonight, it's out of service for maintenance. If they can start that one, it should solve the problem. Vernon quickly checks the work permit and confirms that the scheduled maintenance hasn't yet begun. So that it can take over from the broken pump, the lead production operator signs this pump back into service. But then, at 9.55 p.m., a new problem complicates the situation further. An alarm sounds, warning Jeff Bollins of a small gas leak on the deck above the pump. He silences the alarm and informs another member of the crew who's also down by the broken pump. The situation now escalates rapidly as Bollins receives several more alarms in quick succession, warning of further small gas leaks. These are followed by something more ominous. And they're just coming in one after the other. And then next thing we know, we get high gas alarms, which is very rare. Very serious. It's 10 p.m. Captain Michael Clegg is aboard the maintenance ship Lowland Cavalier, stationed just 25 meters from the southwest leg of Piper Alpha. Suddenly, he sees an explosion as a flash of blue flame shoots out below the platform. In the housing block, Bob Ballantyne is carrying a hot drink on his way to his bunk. This almighty explosion looked at the platform right up. It seemed to lift it right up to the North Sea and just shake it about like a rag. By sheer chance, on another nearby vessel, Charles Miller is taking pictures for his son's school project when he hears the explosion. As he clicks the shutter, a second explosion rocks the platform. He catches the first evidence of what will become a major disaster. There are 226 men stranded on the rig, and it's on fire. On July the 6th, 1988, at 10 p.m., an explosion shatters the calm of evening on the North Sea oil rig Piper Alpha. 226 men are working on board. 10 p.m. In the control room of Piper Alpha, operator Jeff Bollins thinks he's on a routine ship until the explosion throws him from his desk. My experience of the explosion was finding myself 15, 20 foot up the other end of the control room. Lights going out, turbines tripped, everything's down, a lot of smoke. Immediately, Jeff does what he's trained to do. He hits the rig emergency shutdown controls and stumbles out of the wrecked control room. Valves automatically close all the main oil and gas lines. The huge electricity generators shut down. 
but the main alarm panel has been destroyed, so no emergency alarm sound. An eerie silence descends on the normally noisy platform. Ten o five p.m. This amateur home movie, shot from a nearby ship, shows Piper Alpha just after the first explosions. On the blazing platform, Jeff Bollins and twenty of his colleagues are surrounded by flames and smoke. They're trapped twenty-nine meters above the waves. They need to think fast. And there was nowhere to go except downwards. One of the lads found a rope which he tied to the handrail and we started climbing down the rope. They scrambled down to a deck just six meters above the water and jumped into the sea. A safety boat is always close to the rig, and tonight other ships are also nearby, laying undersea pipes. They all launch small rescue craft to pick up survivors. Within five minutes, Jeff and his colleagues are plucked from the water. They are some of the lucky ones. 10.20 p.m. Piper Alpha is shaken by a second colossal explosion, captured on this video. A large section of the rig is engulfed by a roaring fireball. Jeff Bollins sees it all from the rescue boat. The heat was just intense, even though we were maybe 100 yards away. The platforms just look like the kind of things you see in a disaster movie. About 100 men have gathered in the canteen. It's one of the main emergency meeting points because it's close to the helicopter landing deck. But they don't know that the heli deck is already engulfed by smoke and flames. A helicopter rescue is impossible. Smoke begins to creep in. The trapped workers now fear for their lives. Somebody shouted down that they were afraid. And they heard the boys coming back say, You're afraid, everybody's afraid. The evacuation plan calls for them to wait in the canteen for rescue, but it doesn't come. As the situation worsens, rigger Jim McDonald decides to make a run for it, but others trapped with him cling to the belief that help will arrive. I said, well, I'm going to try and get off myself. And I said, if he's make it fair enough, I says, but I'm going to try it. Jim's had 12 years' experience on Piper Alpha. He thinks there's an escape route through the laundry room. I went into the laundry. But when I got into the laundry, I wasn't in the laundry. I was in somebody's room. I said, oh, Jesus, God. I just sat in the corner of the, the corridor in the corner. Disoriented by the thick smoke, Jim McDonald is lost. And every moment he sits there, the odds against him grow. Ten thirty p.m. Dave Lambert and some colleagues also flee the canteen. Unlike Jim, they find their way out onto the blazing deck, but they're surrounded by the fires. The flames are getting closer and closer and closer, and the only option we had to go back into the platform or go into the, this little metal hut. But once they're inside the hut, it hits them. There's no way out. I didn't think we had a chance of getting out, to be quite honest. We were blocked with fire, there was no exit. Basically, we were trapped. In the living quarters, Jim McDonald comes to the growing realization that he's one deck higher up than he should be. He makes one last effort to find the escape route through the laundry. I opened the door and I said, please God, be in there, be in the laundry. And I just opened it and just touched that. Oh, the washing machine. Once outside, he runs across the blazing deck and down to a platform on one leg of the rig. He jumps 21 meters into the bitter cold North Sea. So I went in, when I hit the water, I went right down and it was great feeling it was. Very, very quiet. 
and uh, very, very still. And then all of a sudden, I just shot back up. Jim grabs onto the leg of the rig until a fast rescue craft picks him up. The tears were running down my nose. And this young lad, he said, oh, you didn't have to cry, you, mister. He says, um, you're safe. I says, I'm just crying with happiness. I was that, was that happy, you know? Working under the platform on another rescue boat is Ian Lethem. These photographs show his crew in action. They managed to haul six survivors out of the water. We picked up the last two people and thought, right, we'll, we'll take off now. But as we went to leave, we realized we're entangled amongst debris from the platform. With the inferno blazing out of control overhead, they battled desperately to clear the debris. 33 meters above them, electrician Bob Ballantyne and a group of colleagues are also escaping down the rig. But Bob decides he doesn't like this escape route. I don't know why I changed my mind. Uh, I just said, no, I don't want to go that way. While his friends climb down the west side of the platform, Bob begins to climb precariously down the east side. It's a choice that will save his life. 10.49 p.m. Beneath Bob, on the water, rescue boat driver Ian Lethem is trying to free his craft from the debris. The heat is relentless. It was like being under a giant grill. I mean, it was so hot. I can remember saying to my colleagues, you know, we're going to have to get out of here. This is getting really bad. And I think it was about a split second after that, there was just a huge whoosh. And... I woke up in the water. I came to in the water. 10.50 p.m. Another colossal explosion tears through the platform, scattering debris over 800 meters. Ships one and a half kilometers away feel the vibrations. The fireball engulfs Ian Lethem's boat. Ian never sees the boat, his crew, or the six men they picked up again. He swims to a leg of the blazing platform. Another survivor is clinging to it. I sort of looked around one side and the gentleman in question was Bob Ballantyne was on the other side of the leg. So Ian came floating down the platform, wagging up, pulled him in beside me just for a human company, that he needed someone there with you. Bob and Ian cling to the structure and the whole platform shakes as the fires devour it. With every bang went off, this thing shook. I mean, this leg was immense, it was huge. And we were hanging on to it, and it was getting hotter and hotter and hotter. I mean, it was getting really hot, my ears were starting to blister. Bob and Ian leap into the sea. With the last of their strength, they swim to a nearby ship, and the crew haul them out. They're suffering from burns and exhaustion. Up on the blazing platform, Dave Lambert is trapped in a steel hut. But the colossal explosion at 10.50 p.m. rips the end of it and opens up a new escape route. If that explosion hadn't have blown the end off it, I don't think we'd have survived. We quite there's no other way out. Dave races out of the hut and onto the blazing platform, 45 meters above sea level. As he reaches the guardrail, another explosion blows him over the edge and into the sea. Amazingly, he survives the fall and can see the rescue boats. But totally exhausted from his ordeal, he can't reach them. I had no energy left. And I, I got the stage of thinking, oh, God, don't let me get this far and drown. But Dave's incredible luck holds out. At the last moment, a rescue boat spots him and hauls him from the water. As the last survivors are picked up, Piper Alpha begins to collapse. 11.20 p.m. Another violent explosion shakes the platform. Piper Alpha is now in its death throes. One of the cranes collapses. Then the drilling derrick. 
The whole platform begins to tilt to the east. The main living area containing the canteen where the workers gather to be rescued tips to the north and slips below the waves. There'll be no rescue. The rest of the platform follows it into the North Sea. By 12.45 a.m., the 20,000-ton Piper Alpha platform is gone. This tiny piece, part of a section called Module A, is all that remains. There were 226 men on Piper Alpha, 167, including two rescue workers, die. The tragedy takes everyone by surprise. North Sea oil is the pride of Britain. The country earns huge profits from it. No offshore platform has ever been lost before anywhere. Suddenly, oil rig workers worldwide can sense a new threat. The Piper Alpha disaster takes just one hour and 30 minutes. Now, by rewinding events and going deep into the investigation, we can discover what truly happened. What started the catastrophic chain of events? And how had this massive rig that had operated reliably for 12 years become an inferno? Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. When the UK government launches one of its biggest ever inquiries, senior judge Lord Cullen brings in 89 expert advisors to analyze every second of the disaster. But the extent of the destruction leaves very little evidence. Rod Sylvester Evans spent two years working on the investigation. There was no scene left, apart from part of Module A, which was standing proud from the sea. The rest of the, uh, the platform, all the areas of interest, had, in fact, been lost. With the wreckage of the rig scattered across the sea floor, 145 meters below the surface, all they have is eyewitness testimony, plus Charles Miller's vital photographs. From these scraps of information, they have to solve the entire mystery. Investigators begin to interview survivors. Of crucial importance was the evidence of the control room operator, Mr. Bolands. And he had witnessed a series of gas alarms that had come up just before the first explosion. One hour, 35 minutes to disaster. These gas alarms are all from the production deck. The investigators study the four 15 by 46 meter modules that make up this deck. They conclude that all of the alarms come from one area, Module C. Another clue confirms this. Captain Michael Clegg on the nearby vessel Lowland Cavalier sees a blue flash coming out from the same area. These two pieces of evidence are enough to convince the investigators that Module C has to be the starting point for the disaster. But the flash of blue flame has to have a fuel source. What is it? Piper Alpha produces three highly flammable products. Natural gas, liquefied petroleum gas or LPG known as condensate, and crude oil. All three are prime suspects for the start of the disaster. First, they investigate the platform's main product, crude oil. It burns in a very distinctive manner. Professor Dougal Drysdale is an expert in flame behavior. Once you ignite it, the surface is burning. The flames have a characteristic appearance in that they will tend to be large and sooty. But the initial explosion is not a large sooty flame. It's a blue flash. So Drysdale concludes it cannot be crude oil. That leaves natural gas and condensate. Because it's lighter than air, natural gas rises. Condensate, on the other hand, is heavier than air, so it sinks. 
Investigators revisit the eyewitness testimony from Captain Clegg and make their first major breakthrough. He sees the flash coming out from under Module C. The fuel source for the blue flash must be heavier than air. It can only be condensate. But investigators believe that this explosion was relatively small, barely the equivalent of one car tank full of petrol. How does a small explosion in one module escalate into a disaster that wipes out the giant 20,000 ton platform? A series of massive explosions and fires has destroyed the huge oil platform Piper Alpha and killed 167 men. It's a devastating tragedy with worldwide repercussions for the oil industry. Using advanced computer graphics based on the official report, we go deep into the investigation to uncover the chain of events. Second by second. Investigators believe that the disaster starts with a small explosion of condensate or liquefied petroleum gas. They also pinpoint where the disaster starts, in part of the platform called Module C. But there shouldn't have been any loose condensate in that module. Where did it leak from? To get at the answers, investigators turn their attention to the gas alarms Jeff Bollins observed in the control room immediately before the explosion. We were able to determine that, in fact, the only possible way of explaining the pattern of gas alarms was by a condensate release in the eastern end of the module. The only condensate at the eastern end of Module C is contained in two safety valves. But these are safety devices designed to withstand more than twice normal operating pressures. How could they leak? Then the investigators make a vital discovery. One of these valves had been removed for a routine safety check. Could the open pipe be the source of the mysterious leak? They dig deeper and discover that in normal safety procedures, workers insert a flat metal disc to seal the hole where the valve has been removed. And that prevents any leaks. If the hole was sealed, condensate could not have come from there. But they remain convinced that the safety valve is the prime suspect. To check their theories, they conduct a series of tests on an identical metal disc, tightening its bolts by varying amounts. This video from the inquiry shows the actual tests. The test results show that the sealing disc could leak if workers tighten the bolts without a wrench, leaving them just finger tight. As if the bolts were done fairly loosely, you would look done up when you looked at it, but it, there was a gap. This is a vital breakthrough. Investigators now believe that a leak from a loosely fitted metal disc is the starting point for the entire catastrophe. But there's a problem with this theory. The valve in question was undergoing maintenance. There should have been no condensate in that pipe. Solving this mystery becomes the new focus for the investigators. Using plans of the rig, they trace the pipe down to a different deck, where it connects to a pump but they know this pump was out of service for maintenance. It should have had no condensate in it. Then they talk to the night shift workers. Their evidence reveals that another pump in service that night broke down one hour, 45 minutes before disaster. The lead operator perished so they can't question him. However, the evidence suggests he intended to swap the pump in maintenance for the broken pump to keep production flowing. But the pump undergoing maintenance was missing its safety valve. Because the lead operator was seen actually introducing condensate into this pump very shortly before the accident. There was not only the intent to start it, but there was also the opportunity. Before starting up a new pump, workers must first fill it with a small amount of condensate. 
This happens one hour and 35 minutes before disaster. But this small amount of condensate leaks. The loosely fitted sealing disc, secured only hand tight, triggered the first gas alarm Jeff Bollens heard in the control room. When the pump was ready to start, the lead operator released more gas into it. He would conduct the valves to introduce more condensate, and it was during this period that there was a very major release. Up in the control room, this much larger leak triggered multiple gas alarms, including the high-level alarm that Jeff saw just before the first explosion. At one hour, 30 minutes to go, the leaked condensate explodes in Module C. Investigators are zeroing in on the chain of events, but there's a break in the link. Module C is protected by huge firewalls designed to resist intense flames for up to six hours. And this first explosion is not very violent. But photographic evidence reveals a surprise. Less than 10 seconds after Module C explodes, the picture shows a huge fireball ballooning out of the module next door, Module B. How did it break through the firewalls and spread so fast? The investigators carry out a series of computer simulations and experimental explosions seen here. The results are surprising. While the firewalls are excellent at resisting fire, they can't handle explosions. Even a minor blast can tear them apart. The firewalls are made up of 2.5 by 1.5 meter fireproof panels bolted together. The first explosion breaks up the firewall, launching the panels around module B like unguided missiles. Each panel was equivalent to driving a one-ton car at 24 miles an hour into the pipework. Investigators believe that these flying panels rupture a relatively lightweight condensate pipe in module B. That condensate fueled the fireball seen in the photograph. But this fireball lasted only a few seconds. It may look big, but the investigators don't believe it was lethal enough to destroy Piper Alpha. Something else caused another massive explosion 19 minutes later that doomed the 20,000 ton platform. What was it? Investigators are trying to explain a massive series of fires and explosions that destroyed the gigantic offshore oil platform Piper Alpha, leaving 167 men dead. After two explosions, a new fire was now burning on part of the platform called Module B. It was fueled by something, but what? A sequence of 20 photographs chronicles the early stages of the fire. It's not much, but it's the very best evidence they have. You can see the fireball lifting away from the front of the platform, and that leaves behind uh, a very different type of fire, producing a huge plume of smoke. A smoky plume is characteristic of a crude oil fire. Module B was one of the worst places to have a fire, because it contains tanks that store up to 55 tons of crude oil. With one hour, 10 minutes left, the situation escalates. A colossal explosion shakes the rig. It creates an inferno that rages on the underside of the platform. But this new fire is not in Module B, where the first oil fire is burning. It's below it. How did it get down through the deck? Once again, investigators search for clues in the pictures taken just after the fireball. If you look at the photographs, it's clear that there is a fire below module B. They realize this can only mean one thing. Flaming crude oil is running downwards to fuel this fire. 
they're certain that it drips onto an area where the rig's divers prepare for work. But this area is covered by grates. The burning oil should drip straight through the holes and into the sea. Instead, it settles there, forming a large fire. Again, investigators are stuck. Then they discover a vital clue. The divers have placed rubber matting over these gratings. When they were diving, they didn't want to, with bare feet, step on very sharp grating. And unfortunately, above this area was the high-pressure connecting line to Tartan. Tartan is another oil rig close to Piper Alpha. This pipeline carries high-pressure gas to it. Investigators now believe this oil forms a burning puddle on the rubber matting directly under the pipe containing gas pressurized to more than 120 atmospheres, 70 times the pressure in a car tire. Without this rubber matting, the fire might have been contained, the whole catastrophe prevented. But with it, the pipe heats up quickly, weakening the metal. Intense heat, weak metal, high pressure gas, the next event is inevitable. And when it burst, there was somewhere between 15 and 30 tons of high pressure gas ejected almost instantaneously, and that is what is seen in, in this huge fireball, 150 meters in diameter, completely engulfing the whole of the platform. Gas pours out of the burst high-pressure pipeline at the rate of half a ton per second. Equivalent to nearly the entire domestic consumption of gas in the UK. It continues to do so for a further hour. The failure of the high-pressure gas pipeline changes everything. There was no way back. It's really melting the center out of the platform. There are still two more gas pipelines that run from Piper Alpha. The larger of them contains 1,120 tons of pressurized gas, three times as much as the one that has already burst. Investigators realize that it was now just a matter of time before these other gas pipes failed. One hour, ten minutes before the breakup of the rig, there was no hope of stopping the inferno. An even larger explosion shakes Piper Alpha. One of the two remaining pipelines has burst. Bob Ballantyne survives it. His friends on the other side of the rig are not so lucky. There was an explosion and they were caught up in a fireball and incinerated. Ian Letham's rescue boat was tangled in debris below the rig. The explosion destroyed the boat and killed everyone on board, except Ian. I ended up in the water, looked around the place, and the whole place was just alight. The sea was alight, everything was alight. By now, the fire is so great, photographic evidence is useless. So investigators gather electronic data from other oil rigs connected to Piper Alpha. 40 minutes to go. The investigators discover that the gas pressure in the larger of the two remaining pipelines begins to fall rapidly. It's this which is now burst. Only one gas line connecting Piper Alpha to the Claymore platform 35 kilometers away remains intact. Ten minutes remaining. There's another massive gas explosion. It's the final pipeline failing. One hour and 30 minutes after the chain of events begins, the disaster claims its final victims. The living quarters where so many workers took refuge slips off the platform and down to the bottom of the North Sea taking with it the last of the crew of Piper Alpha. One hour after the housing block collapses, there's nothing left of Piper Alpha except for the burnt-out wreckage of Module A. From tiny scraps of evidence, the investigators have managed to piece together a coherent explanation of the catastrophe. But there is still one more shocking revelation, a final link in the chain involving not failed technology, but simple paperwork. 
the gigantic oil and gas platform Piper Alpha has been destroyed. Second by second, investigators are lining up the pieces. The deadly sequence begins at 9.45 p.m. when workers attempt to start a pump with a critical safety valve missing. What investigators don't understand is why the workers started the pump in this unsafe condition. The permit to work, or PTW, is designed to alert everyone to maintenance work that is underway to prevent just this kind of accident. When investigators analyze the PTWs, they discover that a permit was issued for routine maintenance on one of the pumps at 7.45 a.m. They believe that a separate permit was issued later on for work on its safety valve. But the permits that would prove this theory lie buried in the sunken remains of Piper Alpha, 145 meters beneath the surface of the sea. Then, three months after the accident, salvage teams raise two blocks of living quarters from the sea floor. 81 bodies are recovered and laid to rest. And the investigators are then able to hunt inside for further clues. They find a mass of waterlogged paperwork. Astonishingly, after a raging fire and three months at the bottom of the sea, this paperwork yields critical evidence. And lo and behold, yes, there was a copy of the actual permit to work. And it was a huge buzz because we had heard that one was probably issued, but we weren't sure. And here it was, we actually had the actual copy. This is the original permit recovered from the bottom of the North Sea. Permit to work number 23434 for the maintenance operation on valve number PSV 504, dated July the 6th, 1988. It's the first link in the deadly chain of events. Investigators are now certain that there were two permits issued, one for the pump and a completely separate one for its safety valve. On Piper Alpha, the crew stores permits in different boxes for each area of the platform. This seems logical, but creates a fundamental problem. Because the pump is in one part of the platform, but its valve is in a completely different area. And that means the permits are stored in separate boxes. That really starts to be where the problem comes. The two permits should have been held together. But simple error or clerical mistake, perhaps, meant that these two permits were separate. When the operator checks the pump's permit, there's nothing with it to warn him that the safety valve has been removed. That permit is stored separately in another box. It might as well not have existed at all. So when pump B stopped, and there was a question asked, can I get pump A going? The maintenance lead hand said, yeah, fine. As they attempt to start the pump, they set in motion the chain of events. Investigators believe that the workers on duty that night did not know the safety valve was missing. Otherwise, the experienced operators would never have tried to start the pump. The only permit they see is for the pump. It doesn't mention the safety valve. At the heart of this tragedy, behind the raging fires, the explosions, the collapse of the 20,000 ton rig, and the loss of 167 lives. Behind the entire catastrophe lies a flawed system of permits to work. A tightly linked sequence of events leads to the disaster on Piper Alpha. A break anywhere in that chain could have reduced the impact of the catastrophe or even prevented it. If the permit system had been effective, the night shift would have known a safety valve was missing. If the flat metal disc had been fully tightened, the condensate would not have leaked. If the firewalls had been able to withstand the explosion, the disaster would not have spread. If divers had not placed rubber matting on the metal grate, a pool of burning oil would not have formed, and the massive high-pressure gas pipe would not have exploded, sending Piper Alpha into the sea and 167 men to their deaths. The Cullen Inquiry criticized many aspects of North Sea oil rig operations. 
but its most serious criticisms targeted the flawed permit to work system, which the inquiry identified as the most significant culprit in the tragedy. Occidental Petroleum, Piper Alpha's operating company, paid millions in compensation to victims' families. But because of insufficient evidence, no criminal charges were ever brought. Piper Alpha's survivors pay a far heavier price. Dave Lambert found the burden of survival almost intolerable. I had feelings of guilt. Why me? Why did I survive? Even though, obviously, I might be a survivor. Your whole life actually changes. You, you, everything seemed to stand still. There's, uh, nothing really seemed important. Um, and it, it took quite a number of years to, to get over them feelings. For Ian Latham, sole survivor of his rescue boat, the effect has been more fundamental. I was always happy, didn't care, get on with it, bit of laugh. Now I find life's too short now. I find I've, I've got awful serious. You know, I don't, I can't be bothered with insignificant things anymore. I just crack on with important things now. That annoys me because I, I liked the way I was before Piper. I don't like, particularly like the way I am now. The Cullen Report recommended massive changes to almost every aspect of the way that British offshore operations are carried out. But the lessons learnt have repercussions for the oil industry in Britain and worldwide. The hope is there will never again be a disaster like that of Piper Alpha.